With determined and far-sighted leadership, there is no reason why America cannot surmount these problems as he has always done in the past. And as uh, observed by Mr. Winston uh, Churchill, and I quote his words, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. I'm never going to forget standing and hearing the roar of people, really, uh, in Tahrir Square, so excited about what they were able to do. But with empowerment, there comes a lot of pressure to deliver on those promises. So I think in many ways, we're just starting to see the beginning, the beginning of this tectonic shift uh, so many have characterized it as. So many of you, I'm sure, before you came here this evening also heard from President Obama uh, and his address to say the entire world is watching Libya right now. We certainly saw in the financial markets, most notably the oil markets, they are. And while we aren't doing anything as a country right now, we're leaving it up to diplomats at the moment, I do uh, want to emphasize that there's a great impact right now to all the roles diplomats and those participants in the financial sector play in keeping the kind of, of stability that we take for granted in commerce. We've learned emerging market growth isn't necessarily a smooth trajectory. We've learned dislocations and the disparity of wealth can be dangerous. And we learned that stability is a great enabler to the jobs we carry out day to day. So tonight, we're really embracing one aspect of the financial services industry that informs so much more right now in, in the global dialogue. And that is finance is the first industry to truly be global. And we're going to embrace that tonight. So our first two honorees this evening Mr. Andre Estevez, the CEO of VTG Pactual. He's regarded as the most powerful investment banker in Latin America and Brazil's youngest self-made billionaire. Also, Mr. Joseph Ficalora, Chairman, President, and CEO of New York Community Bank Corps, who, uh, based on his bank's solid earning capacity, was able to refuse TARP funding back in 2008 for the city's largest thrift. So I want to get us straight to this great lineup of honorees and welcome here to the podium uh, the head of BBVA USA Wholesale Banking and Asset Management Group. That's Mr. Sandy Salgado. He's going to introduce our first honoree this evening. So I could ask you to come up here and wind your way through. And if I could just uh, offer a suggestion, these little side pathways are probably the best way up here. So over by table 14 or over by table 29 and around as you try to snake your way through here. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, senhores e senhoras. Muito obrigado, prezados colegas. Muito obrigado uh, por vir esta, esta noite. It gives me great pride to be here this evening in the company of global leaders with such interesting and diverse backgrounds. I would like to thank the Foreign Policy Association for extending me this invitation to such an important occasion. Tonight, we honor the accomplishments of true leaders. Among that group is a man who has been called Brazil's hottest deal maker, and the person to keep an eye on as Brazil attracts an ever-growing number of investors and foreign businesses. I'm speaking, of course, of Mr. Andres Esteves. André began his career with the well-known Brazilian investment bank, Pactual, quickly rising through its ranks as partner, managing partner, and chairman. All of this before he was 40 years old. In 2009, Andre career, his career came full circle after BTG completed the purchase of Pactual from UBS and established BTG Pactual as a full service investment banking institution headquartered in Brazil. 
Today, Andre and his partners are well on their way to achieve their vision of creating the premier investment bank in Brazil. In fact, in, in December 2010, PTG Pactual raised $1.8 billion in new capital from a consortium of prestigious international investors, including leading sovereign wealth funds, such as CIC, GIC, and the Abu Dhabi Investment Council. This important capital raising demonstrated BTG Pactual's preeminent market position in Brazil and the global focus on Latin America as an investment opportunity. With offices in Brazil, Hong Kong, London, and New York, BTG Pactual is positioned for growth and unrivaled success. Please join me in welcoming me to the stage, Mr. Andres Esteves, Chief Executive Officer of BTG Pactual and 2011 Foreign Policy Association honoree. Thank you, Sandy, for the nice words. Uh, thank you all uh, for the presence, and uh, thank you for uh, Foreign Policy Association for uh, this honor of, uh, of, uh, of being here tonight. Um, uh, our colleagues of, uh, of Foreign Policy Association asked me to talk uh, a little bit about Brazil and uh, what's happening there in this moment that uh, uh, the economy is uh, uh, pretty hot. Brazil is in fashion. Market's not so hot at this moment, but uh, 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 how we are seeing things from a structural point of view. And uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I'm very optimist with uh, what's happening in our country right now. It's uh, a structural change. And uh, what's, uh, what's uh, happening now, it's a consequence of a combination of two things. Uh, the, the, the achievement of uh, political consensus and uh, uh, the consolidation of uh, macroeconomic stabilization. These are very important uh, forces that trigger a uh, process of, uh, of development or a process of transformation in Brazil uh, pretty similar to what happened to US 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, the whole story of Brazil, it's, it's not about commodities. Uh, even though that, yes, we are a pretty uh, uh, natural resource rich country. Uh, but the whole story of Brazil is uh, about the transformation of the country into a, a middle class country. Uh, that's what's, uh, what's happening, and uh, which is pretty beneficial for us. And uh, some of you will say, well, but uh, stabilization happened uh, uh, 15 years ago, or political stability already happened a uh, number of years ago, but it's a little bit different than that. It's a consolidation of, uh, of, this, of uh, economic strong situation with uh, basically all the, the right fundamentals in place uh, and uh, combine it. Uh, always could be better, but uh, in good shape. And, uh, and this just happened in the last 10 years when we have really uh, uh, alternate power in, in the uh, in the country when we had uh, all these deep crises, not only the, the last, the second half of the uh, 90s crisis, but also these very tough three years, uh, and the country behaved pretty well. And in terms of political consensus, we are talking about uh, uh, simple things, about not spending more than uh, we earn, uh, keep inflation under control is a social issue more than anything else. Uh, these are simple things, but uh, uh, having that to all the relevant political spectrum is, uh, is an achievement. And, uh, and that's what's what happening now. Uh, so I'm very optimist. Uh, but of course, we have some challenges. And uh, some of you asked me about the challenge tonight. And uh, people talk a lot about uh, the infrastructure challenges. And uh, if they are really bottlenecks for, for growth in the future, yes, they are. Uh, but they are above uh, anything else, they are opportunities. So you should look at uh, all the huge infrastructure demands in Brazil as uh, private sector opportunities. 
You have problems here and there. Uh, we have a, a very tough and busy schedule for infrastructure investments before the Olympics and the World Cup that will happen in our country in the next uh, eight years. Uh, but uh, this is opportunity at the end of the day. The real bottleneck in our economy is something different. It's, uh, it's education. And uh, for those that have investments there and uh, look at our economy closer, uh, this is uh, 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 the, the, the point to pay attention. Uh, we, in order to, to do a good infrastructure project, you have, uh, with a couple billion dollars and uh, maybe a couple of years, you can do almost uh, everything or a lot of things. Uh, uh, but uh, to create uh, uh, 200,000 new engineers, you need uh, more than, uh, uh, than a couple billion dollars in a couple of years. It's a longer cycle, and uh, Brazil still demands a lot from that. We need uh, 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 more quality. We need more quantity. Um, uh, and the good news is that uh, our government, and especially our private sector leaders, know about that. So. I think this is uh, uh, a summary of, uh, of uh, where we are. And uh, 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 to conclude, I think uh, independent of uh, having a not good year in stock markets or maybe some volatility in the markets, but I think the structural transformation is in place. And it's a fantastic place to, to, to invest money and uh, to do business. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity here. Okay. Thank you guys. Andre, we, uh, we, we need to practice for the Olympics, so I'm going to hand the your medal. Okay, very good. Congratulations to you, Andre. Our next presenter, then we're going to welcome up here to the podium, is the current president and CEO of Atlantic Bank, a division of Honoré Joe Ficolores, New York Community Bank, but also is credited as being the driving force of the stabilization and success at Apple Bank during his 28-year tenure. I'm speaking of Mr. Spiros Futsina. He's here. I'm going to ask you to come up and introduce our honoree, and again, the sides, either 14 or 29, are your best, best paths up here to the stage to join me. I think it's a good thing that we're all having to uh, sneak through here. It shows what great turnout we have tonight. I'll hand it's really difficult to find my way around, but I did. Thank you very much. Thank you. How are you? My name is Spiros Vucinas, and I'm um, affiliated with New York Community Bank. And I am uh, honored and uh, am very privileged that I'm here tonight to introduce uh, Joe Ficalora, the president and CEO of uh, New York Community Bank. And, uh, and I would say that uh, I'm very, very privileged for it. I would like also to welcome my friends that there are a lot of them uh, presents tonight. I know Joe for a number of years and I am one of his greatest admirers. I think Joe is, I'm not the only one admiring Joe, I think a lot of people do and for many, many good reasons. Uh, Joe had the, 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 uh, the option the wisdom to manage the, the New York Community Bank through a very difficult time, the financial crisis of 2008, as we all know, and he avoided the traps, the, 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 the mistakes and the pitfalls that almost caused the demise of the, the banking industry in the United States. Joe, was the president of a small little bank in Queens, New York, going back to late 80s and early 90s. And he took the little bank with less than a billion dollars bank, and he grew it into a, with, with a, uh, seven branches, he grew it into a major 
banking institution, very profitable, the so-called New York Community Bank, which is with assets in exceeding $40 million and 272 branches serving five states in the United States. We are, we are very familiar with what happened in, in, in the year 2010 and when the United States government rescued the banking system through the TAR program, Joffrey Calora thought that, uh, considered that the New York Community Bank was a strong bank and did not need any financial assistance from anybody, and therefore decided to go against it. I think New York Community Bank today never suspended, never reduced its dividend through the, the, the crisis period, and also in the, in the, the yield on the today's uh, 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 stock of the New York Community Bank is one of the highest in the industry, in the banking industry. Uh, Joe always used to say, and I think that he is modded, is a modding, was to enhance shareholders' value, and he did quite well. I mean, we weathered the, the, uh, the bank, the, 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 the crisis quite well, and I think that he, he never accepted any, subs any subsidy for anybody on the outside, and I think that the bank is doing, it's one of the best banks in New York. Now, Joe Calora always looked back into, you know, when he, he took the, the New York Community Bank public in, 19, in November, I think it's November 1993, those that they have the, 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 prudent, uh, they were prudent sufficiently to invest into the bank to the, uh, they, uh, and they stay with it with the, the dividend uh, reinvestment, the, the, the investment today will be 3,800%. In other words, what I'm saying is that if somebody invested at that time $1,000, today they will receive $38,000 for it, which is a, I call it a substantial return on, on, any, on anybody's funds. Yeah. I consider Joffrey Calora to be one of the top uh, bankers in the United States. I think he's focused on his bank and he's determined to see his bank continue on the road of ever greater profitability going forward. He is, uh, however, I think I, I, I that's my personal feeling. He's one of the a good human being with uh, the, his professional uh, attributes match his, uh, his personal generosity. I am honored tonight that I'm going to, uh, uh, we are, uh, that the, 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 uh, the Foreign Policy Association is honoring Joe with the, the metal of the, the, the business metal of the 2011, and I would say he's a well-deserved, and I'm very proud I'm here to introduce Joffrey Calora to you. Thank you. Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. I'm, I'm honored and proud to you to do the job, and I think that you have done the best thing, and you're a good patriot, and I think you have done well for your bank Great. and the people that are working for you. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank Jerry. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. I'm sorry. You want to kiss your picture? Okay. Thank you. I guess since I have the medal, I can spare you the speech. <laughs> but I want to really thank Jerry for the very kind words and certainly the association for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. And uh, I want to, at this opportunity, thank the board of directors of the bank, which has evolved through 10 acquisitions, and the executive officers of the bank, who are a composite of those 10 acquisitions. Uh, so the bank today is extraordinarily well positioned to do better in the period in front of us than we have done in the period behind us. And the reason I say that is because the business model of the bank was set back in 1993, when in fact we came off the last credit cycle turn. 
because our particular business model actually does better during an adverse credit cycle. Because the difference between us and other banks in the best of times is we lose zero and other banks lose 45 basis points. The difference between us and other banks in the worst of times is we lose 40 basis points and they lose 4,000 or 8,000 or 9,000 basis points. So the greatest opportunity to create value is point in time differential. And we expect the differential between us and those that we compete with to widen as this cycle evolves. So I'll take a moment and talk about where we are and, and why I have concerns about the period in front of us. There's no escaping the fact that the greatest risk that we in the United States or all of us in the world face is uncertainty and volatility. And that uncertainty and volatility may not sound like very much, but when you're dealing with a fragile economic environment, that compounds in ways that can very meaningfully start fires that become out of control. And, and therefore, we should not you know, assume that the moment, the things that are happening today or overnight represents tomorrow. All it represents is a moment. The more important issues are those that are fundamentally underneath what is obvious. And what we have today is an environment wherein there is material change inevitable in the valuations of the fundamental source of spendable money. Dollars that can be spent in the world, in the United States, in a particular economy, are going to vary dramatically from what was to what will be. And whenever there is meaningful change, there is risk of breakage. The change that is in front of us presents serious risk that those things that we take for granted will not sustain themselves in a period of adversity. Now, of course, whenever there's adversity, there's opportunity. And, and many of us understand that in adversity, sometimes you can have the greatest possible returns. That is our business model, by the way. We do plan to operate through the cycle. So our bank actually does best by lending more under more favorable terms during credit cycle turns. So for example, in the New, New York market, when multifamily homes, those loans were taking down Bowery, American, Greater, Dollar, banks that had been doing multifamily lending throughout this market, we were in fact the bank that was lending to the very people who were buying properties that had been in those portfolios for 20 or 25 cents on the dollar. So our principal asset is an asset that actually is cyclical, meaning that the people who actually win during a downturn, they sell high and buy low. I think we all can appreciate the benefit that that could represent. They sell high and buy low. So for example, one of our principal parties has the first five buildings purchased by his grandfather 30 odd years ago. Five five-story walk-ups. But his portfolio today in the New York market is over a billion dollars in real estate. Major change. How can that possibly happen? It happens because people lend way too many dollars in positive credit cycles and create opportunities for people to buy at deep discounts, solid cash flows in negative cycles. In negative cycles, many of the lenders that were damaged when the breakage occurred are not in the market. So the terms under which loans are created can be more favorable in a negative cycle. The absence of excess creates, again, additional opportunity. The people who are over lending, and certainly we've come through a period during which most of the loans that were made were not made by banks. 60 odd percent of the loans that were made were made by non-regulated entities. Unregulated brokers, 
packaged for first aggregators large dollar volumes of excess lending, meaning the dollars that were put on the table far exceeded the expectation or the reasonable basis for which they could be repaid. But since the aggregator and the broker were not taking any risk, they were being paid on volume, there was a significant profit motivation to do this. The lender, which may have been a bank, but most likely not a bank, the lender for the structured debt might actually be a college, a university, a hospital, a pension fund, somebody who purchased what they thought to be AAA paper with the expectation that they would be repaid. This is a nation of laws. This is a place in which you can reasonably expect that if you participate in a well-established system, the rules of the game are such that you will be repaid. Unfortunately, the rules were not in place, and in many ways, the rule makers knew this. The unfortunate reality is that we all, in this room, are faced with the burden of paying for the mistake. That mistake is large. The consequence in tax is going to be huge. The consequence in risk is going to be huge. The reality is that we're only in the beginning stages of an adjustment period. The reason to believe that we're going to have significantly better quarters ahead is overwhelmed by the reasons to believe that there is more difficulty on the horizon rather than positive solution on the horizon. Because many of the fundamental reasons why we have difficulty aren't being addressed and they're not being solved. Now, so you can eat your dinner, I'll say something a little more positive. The, the, the reality is, and, and, and not everybody's going to agree with this, but I, I contend, and, and many that I know that, that feel the same, I contend that very smart people established ongoing business accounting rules. And I think everybody in the room has heard of depreciation. You know, you, you depreciate an asset over a reasonable period of time. You know, you're, you're a business, you buy a building, you depreciate it over 50 years. It's discernible to a tenth grader how much that asset is worth on your balance sheet, whether the market is up or the market is down. That is visibility, stability, that is good for an ongoing business, to have discernible values that are defined over periods of time despite external consequences which do not change the use, for example, of the building. So if in fact we merely restored, restored ongoing business accounting, therefore did away with mark-to-market accounting, did away with the proposal that was made in September by the FASB that everybody stepped away from. You can't lend money on a 90-day basis. You can't have pensions in the United States of America based on the, the current ways in which they're talking about assessing the liability. The only way pensions work is if the liability is spread over time. If you have to remark the assets in short order, you're not spreading the liability over time. So, so there are fundamental reasons why the changes which have been put in place by a few people who think they're smarter than all the people that preceded them, those fundamental changes are wrong. And if in fact we go back to ongoing business accounting, not only would that be a stabilizing effect, but think of this, you would have hundreds of billions of dollars restored to the capitalization of the banking sector. Using a multiple of 10, which is a reasonable multiple on capital, for lenders, 300 billion becomes 3 trillion. 400 billion becomes 4 trillion. You want to stimulate the economy? You put huge amounts of money back into the capital of the financial markets, and instead of lessening the amount of loans being made, you'd increase dramatically the amount of loans being made. And more importantly, you wouldn't be burdening your children. It doesn't take tax dollars to do this. The eraser 
that took it away with bad accounting merely restores it back to the capital that was taken away on a pro-cyclical, exaggerated basis on, on terms that had nothing to do with the original contract. So if, in fact, the right people stand up and say that we're going to restore ongoing business accounting, there would be a meaningful positive effect to the economy, not just the U.S. economy, the world economy. Because unfortunately, many of the relevant places in the world that actually do follow accounting rules are following rules very similar to the U.S. rules. Unfortunately, not everybody follows the accounting rules. So it's kind of like some of us play with, with rules that, that, that keep us at a particular level, and others play with no rules. When you have that, you have imbalance. So the uncertainties of the future period are very meaningful. Unless we address those uncertainties in a very positive way, we're very vulnerable to the events we do not control, such as the possibility that the flow of oil may change, or any number of other things. A very volatile environment is in front of us. We need as much stability as we can create. Smart people established, for example, rules that created a reasonable way to look at an ongoing business. More important today than at any other time, we need the stability of restoration of ongoing business accounting. Now, I know you didn't come here for that purpose, but I wanted to share this with you. And I'm not even going to take questions. So whoever's next, maybe the main course. <laughs> Thank you. Our next honoree is the Honorable Daniel Sullivan, who became Consul General of Canada in New York in 2006, following a 38-year career at Scotiabank, which culminated in his role as Deputy Chairman of Scotia Capital, as well as a four-year tenure as Director of the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'd also like to ask up here to the podium a very special person to introduce Mr. Sullivan. Um, someone whose seemingly contrarian market bets have catapulted him to hedge fund stardom. The man literally credited with executing the best trade ever. And I'm quoting that. I'm not coining it myself. I'm speaking, of course, of Mr. John Paulson. And if I haven't embarrassed you, I'd like you to come up here to the podium um, and ask you to start us off. Thank you, Margaret. It's a real pleasure for me to present this award to the Honorable Daniel Sullivan in recognition of his contribution to Canadian and U.S. relations. Uh, after the U.S., Canadian investments represent the largest portion of our portfolio. And I've been fortunate to meet with Dan on numerous occasions here in New York. Uh, Dan Sullivan was appointed Council General of Canada in New York by Prime Minister Harper in October 2006, following a distinguished career in the financial services industry. Dan served as Deputy Chairman of Scotia Capital, the Corporate and Investment Banking Division of Scotia Bank, where he enjoyed a, a successful 38-year career. He was also Chairman and Director of the Toronto Stock Exchange and is a former Chairman of the Investment Dealers Association of Canada. Dan is also a board member of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and has served as director of numerous public companies, including Allied Properties, uh, ATT Canada, uh, Cadillac Fairview Corporation, Camco, Monarch Development, and Schneider's Corporation. He also served on advisory boards for Canada Post Corporation and the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation. As Council General of Canada in New York City, Dan's performance as a banker turned diplomat has been extraordinary. His work with many organizations, including the Foreign Policy Association, has been impressive in every sense of the word. He came to the city with the right background. He made legions of friends for Canada. Indeed, as they say, he has been the right person at the right time at the right place. Dan for your outstanding contribution to bilateral relations between our two countries 
It gives me great pleasure to present you tonight with the Foreign Policy Association Medal. Good evening. Thank you, John, for that uh, very generous introduction. I really think that um, they've accidentally reversed the roles tonight. I think John Paulson should be up here receiving this, uh, this award. Um, <clears throat> but um, I'd like to thank the Foreign Policy Association for, for giving me this award. I'm, I, I'm truly honored and congratulate Noel Latif for another very successful full evening. Um, Noel deserves it. I'd also like to congratulate my uh, fellow recipients tonight, uh, Andre and Joseph and Tony Tam Ken. Congratulations, gentlemen. Um, in speaking to you tonight, I feel a little bit like Elizabeth Taylor's uh, seventh husband on his wedding night, and I know what I have to do, but I don't know how to make it interesting. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> It's, it's probably no surprise that I'm going to make some comments on, on Canada. You know, in, in meeting New Yorkers, not a lot of New Yorkers know much about Canada, and Canada is often identified by entrepreneurs and hockey players and cold weather, but seldom about its accomplishments such as the Blackberry, which is a Canadian invention. I've been Consul General here in New York uh, for Canada and living the U.S.-Canadian relationship now for four years and I've been astonished at the extraordinary depth and breadth and uniqueness of this, uh, this relationship. On a on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the focus of the U.S.-Canada relationship is very much on trade and energy and North American security. But the relationship is really built on on geography, it's built on a, a long history of being friendly neighbors, uh, mutual respect, trust, common values, shared goals and foreign policy objectives and many similarities. And the relationship goes well beyond economics. You know, it's about friends and family, uh, vacationing, culture, sports, entertainers, academics, and certainly creating a better world order. I think, as some of you know, Canadian troops are shoulder to shoulder with American troops in the most dangerous area of Afghanistan. Now, in, in my view, the United States and Canada has the best bilateral relationship of any two countries in the world, and I think it's absolutely unique. Now, this relationship is strong because it, it goes beyond Washington and Ottawa. It really stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific and encompasses regional governments on both sides of the borders, regional um, MOUs like you know, dealing with cleaning up the Great Lakes. It's about governors and premiers and mayors on both sides of the border and even uh, minor sports teams. So that's really what this relationship is all about. It's, it's the day-to-day -day kind of interaction that takes place between the two countries. Now, the two countries don't always agree but uh, we can resolve our differences and we're determined to maintain the strong partnership that does exist. Th this relationship is deeply integrated, it's, it's complex, it's hugely interrelated and very interdependent. The, the United States and Canada, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the economics. It enjoys the largest, most integrated economic relationship in, in the world. It's by far and away the largest trading relationship of any two countries. 70% of Canadian exports go to the United States. Now on the other side of the coin, Canada is the United States' largest export market. Canada buys four times more goods from the United States than China does, and more goods than the 27 EU countries combined. Canada is the largest export market for 34 of the 50 states. 
So you can see the importance of Canada in terms of an export market for the U.S. Now it's interesting to note that one-third of the Canada-U.S. trade is what we call intra-company, same company on both sides of the border. Another one-third is established supply chains. This is where parts are made on one side of the border and then moved into a finished product on the other side of the border. And I, I say this because really what it comes down to is Canada and the United States make things together. We have these supply chains that are very important and it's very different than the old notion of trade where you actually trade finished products. What we're doing is very much part of a North American supply chain. And this creates opportunities for, for both countries. Virtually all of Canada's major cities are within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So we're very much a part of the U.S. production grid. It's, it's really the efficiencies of the North American supply chain that allow business and workers to, to compete effectively with Asia and Europe. And I'll say a little more about this in, the, in, in a few minutes. But you know, we're not only neighbors, we're really economic partners. And that's, that's, that's very important. Now, no discussion of the Canadian-U.S. relationship would be complete without just mentioning the energy relationship. I think, as many of you know, Canada is a country that's very rich in natural resources. We're the, the United States' largest and most reliable, I have to say, supplier of foreign energy, whether it be oil, natural gas, uranium, hydroelectricity, and we have been for about the last 20 years. The U.S. imports 60 percent of its oil. And most Americans don't realize that, that Canada is the largest foreign supplier of oil to the United States. We supply more oil than Saudi Arabia and Iraq combined. So Canada is a very important energy supplier, and we, su we supply about 13 percent of all the energy that's consumed in the United States. And I should mention that Canada has the second largest reserves of oil in the world next to Saudi Arabia. And from the U.S. perspective, Canada is really quite strategic in assuring energy security and reducing the U.S.'s dependence on the Middle East and Venezuela. So, you know, we're, we're very much partners in a North American economy. Certainly North American integration has contributed to to the creation of opportunities for both countries in terms of developing global markets. And with the emergence of powerful competitive economic trading blocks like Asia and Europe, Canada and the United States must take policy action that is going to make North America more efficient and competitive and effective economic unit. We're going to have to deepen and broaden the, the trading relationship that we have and improve the integration. NAFTA has certainly been a home run for, for both countries. It's been remarkably successful. I think it's laid a very strong foundation for the economic growth of, of both countries. I think what we may need is to take NAFTA to another level and re-energize the U.S.-Canadian economic relationship and build on the synergies and the competitive advantages that both countries have. I think another thing that has to be done is regulatory overburden has to be reduced. It necessarily restricts trade, and I think it has to be dealt with if we're going to be competitive. Perhaps we need to focus on perimeter security and make our northern border more, more friendly to the flow of goods and, and people. I'm certainly very encouraged by a meeting two weeks ago by uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Harper, and they agreed on a, a new initiative that is called Beyond the Border, a Shared Vision for Perimeter Security and Competitiveness. This is really a framework that will be put in place to reduce the thickening of the border and um, make the border more efficient, but not reduce the security at the border. I think this is a great initiative, and, and um, I think it's going, to, it's going to certainly help both, both countries and our North American economy. One of the other things is I think we have to discard this very ridiculous notion of protectionism. It causes dislocation, it causes terrible disruption in terms of long established supply chains. I think it reduces North American competitiveness. 
it increases costs, and it has unintended consequences, one of which I think is job losses. So it's, it's very important that, that we deal with this. Um, as a course, I meet with quite a few congressmen, and I find many have said to me that why Buy American, for example, is good politics, they recognize as bad economics, and I think they're bang on from that standpoint. I think also perhaps the United States has to follow Canada's lead in entering into more free trade agreements with Latin American countries. And I think we really have to start building a, an America's economy, and hopefully that's something that will get done. Now the U.S. Economic Partnership is, in my mind, has been a remarkable success. And I think we can look for even a more successful future with it through enlightened government policy. And hopefully this will uh, be the case, and I think the recent initiative between uh, Prime Minister Harper and President Obama is certainly a step in the right direction. I think I'm running out of time, but be before I stop, this is a financial services dinner, and I just want to take a, make a few comments about the Canadian financial system and how well it did uh, during the financial crisis. Canada is very proud of its banking system, and we're very proud not only about the Canadian banks are doing in Canada, but what also the Canadian banks are doing in the United States and internationally. I think as many of you know that Canada was the only G7 country that didn't have to bail out its banks. Its banks that had AAA credit ratings kept their credit ratings, and the World Economic Forum has called the Canadian banking system the strongest in, in the world. I get asked regularly, you know, why did the Canadian banking system and the Canadian mortgage market not, not collapse as it did in a number of other countries? And I'll very quickly take you through a few reasons. We have the same factors and circumstances that led to the financial crisis in other countries like excess liquidity, uh, low interest rates, easy credit, uh, credit rating systems that didn't necessarily work, greed, and poorly designed compensation systems, securitization, financial engineering. Canada had all those. Um, but we avoided the crisis for a couple of reasons. And firstly, Canadian bank regulation had higher capital requirements, lower leverage limits, and uh, a much higher standard in terms of definition of capital. Also, and this is perhaps a bit of luck, um, Canadian investment bank activities were done within the commercial banks for the most part. So the investment banks were subject to the same kind of leverage restriction as the commercial banks. The second difference, Canada had a regulatory system that was well coordinated, lots of collaboration between the regulators, fewer regulators, and they met regularly to assess the system risk. A third reason, has to do with, uh, with bank supervision, which I'll, I'll come back to in just a second, but that's, that's been a, a hallmark of, of Canadian regulation. And the fourth reason deals with the, the residential mortgage market and the rules and practices we had, which was quite different than the U.S. Canadian banks originate a large proportion of the residential mortgages. They tend to keep these mortgages on their balance sheets, so they're concerned about the credit quality and did the proper kind of assessment of, of these mortgages. Another, another factor in the marketplace is that mortgages in Canada are not tax deductible. So there was no overconsumption on, on housing. People didn't take excessive risk in, their, in the way they leveraged their, their home ownership. And you know, there was an incentive to pay down their mortgage. So I think that's an, an important difference. And also mortgages in Canada are, are recourse mortgages, unlike many of the states in the U.S. So borrowers have little incentive to walk from their mortgages and, and default, because in Canada, if they walk, they're still personally liable for their, for their mortgage. Also in Canada, you can only lever your home up to 80%, so you need 20% real equity, unless you have insurance. And, and lastly, Canadian banking practices, I would have to say, were were more disciplined. We had few high, um, you know, high ratio loans and subprimes and adjustable rate loans, but that type of financing was, was, was discouraged. Now, it's interesting to note that while the Canadian mortgage 
lending rules and practices are more conservative. Home ownership in the U.S. and Canada in 2007 was virtually the same at 67 percent. Now what that shows is you have two very different home financing systems, one more risky than the other, but they produce the same rate of home ownership. Another interesting fact is in Canada, the mortgage market is much more private sector. The Canadian government didn't, didn't push imprudent lending practices through policy-driven initiatives or um, government agencies, which you know, to a large extent, encourage, you know, high-risk mortgage lending. Now, given all the turmoil in the financial service industry over the last few years, rules and regulations are important, and I think we all recognize the importance of them. However, rules have two problems. Firstly, rules often fix yesterday's problem. You know, they lag the market. Industry innovation often gets ahead of rules. And secondly, Rules have unintended consequences that only become clear over time and I think give a false sense of security. So for these reasons, in my mind, rules have to be backed up with really good supervision. And that was the case in Canada. An institution will, will never have enough capital, regardless of what the capital requirements are, if there's a material flaw in the risk management system of that institution. So, in my mind, supervision really does matter. And it's, it's really a, the, the task of figuring out whether there can be a breakdown in the risk management system of an institution, whether the culture of that institution and its appetite for risk is gonna create dangers that could lead to insolvency. You have to understand what's going on in the institution. Rules, in my mind, simply don't go far enough. Now, I, I'm pleased to see that the U.S. financial reform includes some of the elements that I've, I've just mentioned. I get a sense that the U.S. and its financial reform is on the right track, and I think undoubtedly will, will allow the system to be a lot more resilient and underpin the economic recovery. So to, just to summarize what I've said, I think that certainly the conservative culture in Canada has paid off through this difficult period. I think with the absence of, of pro-home ownership rules that are advocated by, by governments, I think has been a, a blessing for Canada. Now in closing, I just wish to say that the financial service industry is a wonderful industry and I was very pleased to be a part of it. When things are good in the industry, they're very good. And when things are not so good in the industry, they're still good. Thank you. Congratulations to you. And uh, for our final keynote of the evening, um, I'd like to, of course, begin honoring Dr. Tony Tenkengam, whose career has spanned from the Minister of Education to his current role of Deputy Chairman and Executive Director of one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world with assets of over $300 billion. I would also like to welcome to the stage a man that has built successful financial service businesses himself on three continents and is currently chairman of Barclays America. I'm talking about Mr. Archie Cox, who we well know here at the Foreign Policy Association as chairman of this organization as well. And we'll present the FPA medal. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Kind introduction. Uh, good evening, and let me extend my thanks to everybody for joining us tonight uh, and making this evening such a success. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, my real pleasure and purpose tonight is to introduce Dr. Tony Tam Yang Yam, the Deputy Chairman and Executive Director of the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation. A not insignificant institution, as you've just heard. A sovereign wealth fund first established in 1981, just over 30 years ago. Uh, its investment portfolio is also global. You've heard how big it is. Um, with about 40% or so of its assets invested in the Americas and the balance in Asia and Europe. 
As if Dr. Tan doesn't have enough to do at GSIC, he also serves as chairman of the National Research Foundation, which advises Singapore's cabinet and promotes research. He's deputy chairman of the Research Innovation Enterprise Council, a strategic coordination body. As for his past, Dr. Tan has served as Minister of Finance and concurrently as the Minister of Trade and Industry, as Minister of Education, as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defense, and as Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Security and Defense. As if that's not enough, before serving in these different posts, he served as Chairman and CEO of Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation, OCBC as it's known. What a distinguished career. I cannot think of a more fitting person to honor tonight, and it is my great pleasure as chairman to present Dr. Tan with the Foreign Policy Association Medal for his outstanding leadership and service in both the public and private sector. I should also say it's not easy to wend one's way up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Archibald Cox, <coughs> Chairman of the Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Leo Latif, President and CEO of the Foreign Policy Association. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to express my deep appreciation to the Foreign Policy Association for honoring me with your medal, and also to Mr. Cox for his kind words, and Mr. Neil Latif and his staff for the very cordial reception accorded to me and my colleagues. In honoring me, you also honor my colleagues in the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, GIC, with whom I've worked for many years. We thank you for the award and for the significant distinction. I would like to take the opportunity this evening to share a few thoughts about the global economic outlook, and particularly on how GIC views economic prospects in the United States, which is a major region for GIC's investments. The last few years have been very difficult for the US and the global economy. In 2008 and 2009, the world was on the brink of a global depression. Last year, the global economy stabilized and recovered modestly. This year, US growth may reach 4%, a substantial improvement over what was expected as short as two months ago. The improving outlook for the US reflects healthier household and financial sector balance sheets, which have been repaired over time, as well as strong fiscal and monetary stimulus. In particular, after the fiscal stimulus package passed by Congress and signed by President Obama into law in December last year, and the second round of quantitative easing by the Fed Economies are becoming more confident that a self-sustaining recovery in consumer and business spending 
is beginning to take hold in the United States. In addition, financial conditions have become more supportive, with banks increasingly willing to lend. The improving economic backdrop and supportive policies will likely boost equity markets and other risk assets, which in turn will increase consumer and business confidence and speed up balance sheet improvements. All of these will be helpful for a more vigorous economic recovery. The outlook for Europe is more mixed. Some, some economies in Europe are doing well, Germany particularly, and also the countries in Northern Europe. Other peripheral countries are likely to experience continued economic contractions. Overall, the specter of uh, sovereign insolvency looms as a threat to the U European recovery and indeed to the European Monetary Union itself. The major challenge for the Eurozone is to deal with the sovereign debt crisis which has engulfed so far Greece and Ireland and could well include Portugal and Spain in the coming months. However, European policy makers, including those in the core countries like Germany, have reiterated on many occasions their commitment to the integrity of the European Monetary Union and we believe that European leaders will do what is necessary to preserve the European Union for both economic and political reasons. However, political expediency means that policy makers are likely to be more reactive than proactive and thus markets may experience more volatility. Still, economic growth in Europe, dominated by Germany, could average around 2% this year, with exports remaining healthy and domestic demand benefiting from a low cost of capital. The growth outlook for Asia remains bright, even as countries grapple with inflation, emerging asset price bubbles, and large capital inflows. Economic growth in Asia will remain strong, although there is a risk that a strong US recovery could lead to upside surprises, resulting in more severe inflation and asset price problems. China and India could see economic growth in a region of 7 to 9 percent. But both countries have to ensure that inflation and rising asset prices do not get out of hand. China in particular will have to skillfully withdraw the huge monetary and fiscal stimulus enacted during the global financial crisis without upsetting the ongoing leadership transition which is now taking place. For example, China will have to deal with an expected rise in non-performing loans from the rapid expansion in credit. Fortunately, low leverage in the financial system, relatively healthy balance sheets and strong growth make it easier for the Chinese to deal with such issues as long as they are able to engineer a soft landing over the next two years. At the same time, some progress is being made to rebalance the Chinese economy towards greater domestic consumption, improve income distribution between the coastal and the inland regions, and between the urban and rural households. 
the challenge for India is complicated by the ruling party's need to continue public spending and subsidies despite the chronic public finances uh, public finance deficits so that the government can renew its leg uh, leg uh, legitimacy to carry out further necessary reforms. This has led to the occasional backtracking in economic policies as a Congress party tries to consolidate it, its power in key local elections. Asian countries that are part of the global manufacturing chain, including Korea, Taiwan and Japan, will benefit if global growth remains strong. And as a commodity producer, Indonesia will also do well. In addition, Indonesia's large size and improving policy and business environment means that domestic demand will remain a major contributor to economic growth. So overall, the global economic outlook for 2011 looks better than in the last few years. The United States looks like it will finally experience robust above trend growth. Europe, notwithstanding its debt overhang, could grow, although more modestly. Asia and other important emerging economies will grow strongly, but will begin to slow down to a more sustainable growth path. However, there are a few clouds on the horizon. There are five economic and political problems which could derail this relatively rosy outlook. First, US unemployment is likely to remain high even, even though, uh, uh, and if there are signs that the labor market is improving, and it could be several years before U.S. unemployment rate returns to a more normal level. In the short term, a period of stronger job creation is needed for the U.S. economic recovery to be sustainable. Over the medium term, high unemployment has serious social and political consequences. It could lead, for example, to insular or protectionist policies. Second, the U.S. housing sector remains weak and could be a risk to sustainable growth. The size of the foreclosure pipeline and the supply overhang in certain markets are of concern. A fall in, ho in housing prices of more than 15% could cause consumer confidence to collapse with adverse consequences for economic growth. Third, inflation is becoming a risk for many developing economies, especially those in Asia and Latin America. These economies experienced strong recoveries in 2010, but fiscal and monetary policies have remained accommodative. Policy makers have been reluctant to tighten too soon lest the recovery in the U.S. proves to be short-lived. This, however, increases the risk that policymakers will be behind the curve, especially if U.S. growth were to be strong. The recent rise in food and commodity prices adds to this risk. Inflation is not an immediate threat to the U.S., but it may become an issue in the coming years given the extremely loose monetary policy and a bias to remain accommodative until employment is clearly on the men. With the amount of money that is being pumped into the US economy and a very large budget deficit, there is a risk that investors could eventually lose confidence in US assets and the US dollar. Fourth, and relatedly, Excessive global liquidity could fuel asset price bubbles 
and plant the seeds of a sharp boom bust cycle. Real estate values in many countries in Asia have already hit or surpassed their historical peaks. Equity markets have pulled back somewhat, but remain elevated. Even in the US, a strong recovery this year, for example, a 20 to 30% rise in the S&P would increase the probability of a more painful adjustment down the road. Finally, geopolitical and global policy risk is higher and perhaps more unpredictable than it has been for some time. In the Middle East, the ouster of President Mubarak in Egypt was unexpected. Demonstrations have emerged elsewhere in the Arab world. The momentum of popular uprising could continue for some time, raising the risk of political disruption in all rich states or states that control key shipping routes like Algeria, Bahrain, Libya, and Yemen. The risk premium in all prices and volatility in all markets could thus continue to be high. More generally, with economies growing at different speeds and continued imbalances among countries, policymakers will need to work hard and cooperate closely to avoid conflicts over trade, monetary policies, exchange rates, and capital flows. Let me now turn to the medium-term outlook. A major change in the post-crisis environment is the increasing importance of the large emerging economies anchored by Brazil, Russia, India, and China, widely known collectively as the BRICS. The global financial crisis seems to have given impetus to those who forecast that the West will decline with the rise of China and other emerging markets. This is you know, an extreme view. Some rebalancing in economic power will happen and indeed is a good thing. But the US will remain the global power and more important, a leader in terms of ideas, technology, and the depth and liquidity of its financial markets. With these strengths, America is likely to remain the single most important source of global prosperity for many years to come. And these are not just words. More than a third of GIC's investments are in the US. And GIC has offices across the US which employ more than 100 investment professionals. Despite the shift in economic power and GIC's desire to take advantage of opportunities in the emerging world, the US will continue to be a prime destination for GIC's investments for many years to come. Of course, the US faces some daunting medium to longer term challenges. First, there is America's growing public indebtedness. Government debt is burgeoning, and persistent current account deficits have led to growing indebtedness to foreigners. The recent recession and the rising costs of health care and entitlement programs such as Social Security, along with the rising costs of servicing national debt, will claim large shares of future revenue. Aging and Deteriorating infrastructure in the US require large investment outlays, which will put further pressure on government finances. While a Greek-like debt crisis is unlikely to happen in the US, the costs of servicing such debts could have ne negative consequences for the long-term health of the US economy. Longer term, fiscal sus uh, sustainability will require difficult reform of entitlements. These are 
complex issues and a quick fix is unlikely. Solving these problems will require bipartisan cooperation. However, with determined and far-sighted leadership, there is no reason why America cannot surmount these problems as he has always done in the past. And as uh, observed by Mr. Winston uh, Churchill, and I quote his words, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. <laughs> Second, America needs a well-educated labor force, but its education system, particularly K-12, and the bulk of the primary and secondary schools are not training students for the new knowledge economy. This is not to say that the U.S. is not able to compete. The U.S. spends twice as much on higher education as compared to the major OECD countries. American universities top world ranking tables. Americans publish more scientific papers and win more Nobel Prizes. The U.S. system sets a global standard but there are parts of the U.S. education system that lag badly behind the rest of the world. Finally, I worry that the U.S. is becoming increasingly insular in outlook. With its current levels of immigration, the U.S. is one of the few developed countries that may avoid demographic decline and keeps its share of the world population. But this could change if uh, xenophobia, concerns over jobs, or reactions to terrorism closes its borders. Against these challenges are America's deep and enduring strengths, openness, innovativeness, and entrepreneurship. If the U.S. remains open, immigration would be one of its strengths. In contrast to other developed countries, Immigration will dampen and slow down the expected aging of populations and keep the U.S. as the third most populous country in the world decades from now. Equally important are the benefits of immigration for America's soft power. Attracted by the upward mobility of American immigrants, people want to come to the U.S. America has a great advantage of being able to attract the brightest and the most energetic young people from around the world and give them the opportunity to thrive in America's open and vibrant economy and society. The U.S. remains an innovative and competitive economy. The World Economic Forum has ranked the U.S. fourth after Switzerland, Sweden and Singapore in global economic competitiveness. The US economy leads in many new growth sectors such as information technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology. And the US also has seen significant innovations in what might be called all world sectors like agriculture and manufacturing. The US openness to Globalization, if it continues, will also drive productivity improvements. And the results are impressive. The U.S. is still a leader in research and development spending among the large countries. While American inventors registered more patents than the rest of the world combined, U.S. venture capital firms invest 70% of their money in domestic startups. A 2010 survey by the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor ranked the U.S. ahead of other countries in opportunities for entrepreneurship because the U.S. has a favorable business culture, the most mature venture capital industry, close relations between university and industry, and an open immigration policy. Innovation has also driven American companies abroad to take advantage of the growth 
in emerging market economies. In doing so, America's openness, innovative, and entrepreneurial zeal have again been enduring sources of strength. In summary, the economic outlook for 2011 looks better than in recent years. Problems and challenges remain, both in the short as well as the longer term. But I believe that America has enduring strengths which will revitalize the U.S. economy and throw up many opportunities for profitable investments. Ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. remains a prime destination for GIC's investments. With the U.S. open and receptive attitude to foreign investments, GIC will continue to invest in America. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all our honorees. Thanks to all of you. Thank you to Noel Latif of the FPA and all the staff for putting on this evening. Thank you.